morning and welcome to our service for April 25th. We are Daniela, Samantha, Calista, Sophia. As we gather together, we invite the Lord to shape our souls with his words and inspire our lives with his good work in us. This morning, we invite you to rejoice in God's guidance by joining us in reciting the praise of God's people written in Psalm 25. Lord, show me your ways. Teach me how to follow you. Guide me in your truth. Teach me. You are God, my Savior. I put my hope in you all day long. Good morning. Welcome to our online service this morning and hello to those of you who are joining us at our watch gatherings. I have to admit I'm not very excited about talking to this camera again. It doesn't laugh at any of my jokes. <laughs> hey, what's the difference between Jesus and pizza? Jesus can't be taught. <laughs> That's just a little joke for you this morning to hopefully make you smile or Maybe you groaned. <laughs> There's certainly still many joys to life, despite the disappointments that might come with the restrictions again. We had originally planned to have a baptism and membership service this morning, but because of the changing restrictions, we've decided to postpone, postpone that. But this has opened a door if you are interested in being a part of it. If you have been thinking about baptism or becoming a member here at DBC, please contact Pastor Dennis this week and he'll get you some details. We want to take a minute to thank you for your generous giving. 
the property and finance committee has been meeting and making some decisions on some things around the church and that wouldn't be possible without your support. And just a reminder about the ways you can give. Checks can be dropped off at the church during office hours or an e-transfer can be sent anytime to the address on your screen. And now as we go to a time of prayer, I invite you to join me in responding in praise. Even though life and plans might feel uncertain right now with the restrictions going back and forth, I would like to declare the certainty of God's love. So when I say, God, we praise you, you can respond with, your love is certain. God, we praise you, your love is certain. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, thank you for the gift of today that we might have life in you and experience your mercy and grace. Thank you for the opportunity to worship together in our watch gatherings as well as worshiping online together. Even if we're doing it at different times, you are still a part of the same body of Christ, and you are with us the same, no matter where we are sitting right now. We praise you that your presence is near to each of us, even if it feels like we are far away from everyone. God, we praise you. Your love is certain. Father, we pray for all the plans that are being made right now, whether it's Bible camps or family summer plans, plans to try and visit family and friends, plans for soccer camp and family adventure week, plans for fall programming, plans for graduation ceremonies and parties, plans for funerals, for reunions, for so many different things that we would like to do this week or this summer and beyond. God, we ask that your hand be upon the plans that we make and that you would guide us and direct us to make the right decisions. We ask for patience, Heaps of patience as we continue to wait for restrictions on gatherings to lift again. Help us to keep in mind that your plans are better than ours and that you knew all of this in advance and that all things will work for your good. God, we praise you. Your love is certain. Lord, give us hearts of worship this week. Help us to see you in the sunrise and the sunset. Help us to see you in the sun and the rain. Help us to see you in the good times and the uncertainty. Help us to seek you in times of doubt and in times of frustration. Help us to seek your ways, your plans, and your opportunities. Help us to seek your wisdom, your passion, and your grace. May we praise you in all circumstances and remember how good you truly are. God, we praise you. Your love is certain. To close, I would like to pray some lyrics from a song called Let Me Not Wander. Let me not wander from your commandments. Let me not wander from your word. For your word I've hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you. And with my whole heart I have sought you. With my whole heart. So blessed are you, Lord, in all of your ways. I open my mouth, declare your praise and I will meditate on your word, and I will not forget your promises to me. Teach me to follow you, because you are good, because you are faithful, Lord, so teach me to follow you. God, we praise you. Your love is certain. Amen. Hi there, Greg from Ranger Lake Bible Camp with another Missions Minute. We love the outdoors at Ranger Lake Bible Camp. We love canoeing on our private lake. And a few years ago, we started something called Wild Camp, which is a camp for boys, for young preteen and young teen boys, where they live on our lake, they sleep at a remote fort site, they make most of their meals, they do a lot of outdoor activities like canoeing and the like. We've always hoped that we could take that camp on the road. And so that's what we're planning this summer with older teens. Uh, guys and girls are gonna be able to go on a canoe trip with us up north around the Mississippi area. We love that area. There's lots of wild, there's challenges waiting. Challenges like canoeing across a lake, like portaging and setting up campsites and catching your own supper. We know that where there's challenges, there's opportunities for growth. And we know that when you're God's creation, those opportunities to grow aren't just physical or emotional, but they're spiritual as well. And that's why we're looking forward to having our leaders journeying with these teens, challenging them to grow spiritually. 
We're gonna have those dates and plans released on our website on March 1st, so you can watch our website for that. Thanks so much for your support of Ranger Lake Bible Camp. God bless.
you for joining us for this worship service today. To those watching who are part of our DBC family, I want to invite you to intentionally be praying for opportunities and promptings to extend encouragement, prayer, and service to one another, and to those you interact with who do not yet know our Lord Jesus. Allow the Lord who lives in you to live through you. But if that's hard for you to do right now because you're feeling alone or discouraged, I invite you to reach out. Reach out to someone in this church family. Reach out to me or one of the elders or staff. Invite us to come alongside to pray for you, to help you, to walk alongside you. You see, COVID restrictions can limit our public gatherings, but it cannot limit our ability to care for and serve one another. If anyone who is listening to this would like to learn more about what it means to know and follow Jesus, we invite you to contact us as well. You can go to our website at dalmanybiblechurch.ca and you can get a hold of someone there and we would be more than happy to talk with you about our Lord Jesus. For our message today, we're going to continue our study of the book of Revelation and today we're looking at chapter 11. The further and further we get into this study, it reminds me of the times that I've gone to a restaurant that serves international cuisine that I was totally unfamiliar with. Nothing on that Spanish or that Korean or Lebanese menu made any sense to me. And I kind of felt uneasy, confused, and uncertain. I didn't want to make a choice that I'd regret later. That's how I sometimes feel when I get to certain chapters in Revelation. There are so many interpretive options that it leaves me feeling uneasy, confused, and uncertain. Well, the interpretation I'm going to present to you today is based on where I've landed primarily because of the context and cross-reference passages. Theologians say that chapter 11 is the most difficult chapter to interpret in the entire book and that there are several interpretations to these apocalyptic symbols. However, there's no question the description of these end times events focus on the themes of our witness and our worship of the Lord Jesus Christ. One of my challenges has been the volume of information that I've read. I've got 25 pages of type notes that I have to go through to prepare today. I'm going to be selective in what I focus on in this chapter. My prayer is that you will have two things come to you. One is that you'll come away with a clear conviction and confidence in the purpose and power of sharing and living out your faith. And number two, that you will be able to rejoice in the absolute certainty that Jesus is worthy of our faith. You'll notice as you come to this chapter that the very first word here is then. That word then implies a consequence to what was previously said or a description of another period of time or another set of information. Actually, the King James Version and the New American Standard Bibles faithfully interpret what is called a Greek conjunction, which in English is the word and, and that's what they use instead of the word then. Therefore, I think it's proper for us to interpret chapter 11 as simply a continuation of chapter 10, not a new set of information. The chapter provides two distinct messages that God has willed that his people continue to share the gospel in the face of an ever-increasing persecution. The first image here is, I've defined, a temple that gets measured. Chapter 11, verse 1 and 2. Then I was given a measuring rod like a staff, and I was told, Rise and measure the temple of God and the altar and those who worship there. But do not measure the court outside the temple. Leave that out, for it's given over to the nations, and they will trample the holy city for 42 months. Elsewhere in Scripture, symbolic actions were used to convey God's message. For example, in Isaiah, there's a, there's a passage there in chapter 20 where Isaiah walked naked to prophesy Egypt's captivity to Assyria. In the book of Ezekiel, chapter 12, the prophet dug a hole in the wall to talk about impending exile. 
And in the New Testament, in Acts 21, Agabus, the prophet, tied his hands and feet uh, with Paul's belt to speak about Paul's future imprisonment. Measuring is a symbolic way uh, here of declaring God's preservation. You read about that in Ezekiel chapters 40 to 42. John here is given a measuring tool, a hollow stick that was thought to be somewhere around three meters long. He's told to measure three things. The temple. Now, the, the text, two texts come to mind when you talk about measuring the temple. One is Ezekiel 40 to 43. Ezekiel there was asked to measure out the dimensions of a future temple. There's lots of discussion as to whether that was to be a literal temple built in Jerusalem before the return of Jesus, or whether it's um, a temple that will be present during a period after the return of Jesus during his 1,000 year reign, or if it just simply anticipates the final glorious presence of God shared by God's people in eternity. The other text is Zechariah 2. The prophet Zechariah was asked to measure out the boundaries of a future city of Jerusalem. The second thing he's to measure is the altar. In Revelations chapter 6 verse 9 and chapter 8 verse 3, the altar is the place in which the prayers of God's people invoke the powerful work of God. The third area is it says he's supposed to not measure a place but those who worship there. Unlike those in Laodicea who claim to worship God, but he was actually excluded from their religious practices, these people who are being measured are followers of God, those who belong to him. Many from the seven churches, as well as those of us today who have put our faith in Jesus, would be included in this group that is measured. Why is John told not to measure a section of the temple called the outer court? The only difference is that those in the outer court are not protected the same way as those by the altar. This role of measuring implies God's ownership and protection. We've already read how God protects spiritually and physically throughout the revealed judgments, his people. References to trampling coincide with descriptions of persecution. And so we should not take this to be two classes of believers, but as we'll shortly see, we will see it's God's, that God's protection does not mean all his witnesses will avoid persecution. It's difficult to know what to make of the number here, 42 months. It's the same as what you'll read later in Revelation of 1260 days, or three and a half years, or time, times, and a half. They're all the same thing. Numbers are so symbolic in Revelation. I wonder, what would come to mind for Jewish Christians who read this? Well, there was a time in Jewish history when the nation experienced its worst period of extreme suffering under, under the dominance of a Seleucid king named Antiochus Epiphanes IV. He ruled beginning in 167 BC. He was a passionate pagan who made it a capital offense for the Jewish people during that time to own Hebrew scripture, to observe Jewish rites, and he desecrated the temple by dedicating it to pagan gods, and he sacrificed pigs on the altar. It was a time of extreme suffering. Later, as Jesus spoke to his disciples about a future time of suffering, he said the days would be short and intense, but it would be limited in duration, much like this time when Antiochus, and Antiochus Epiphanes ruled for three and a half years. The measurement of the temple reminds the early believers and us that there are difficulties, persecution, and suffering. Yes, it's intense, but it will not last. The use of the term half means it will be cut short. This image introduces the explanation of how it would come to pass, which leads us to the second image, two witnesses, chapters 11, verses 3 to 14, and specifically we're going to break that into two spots. First, we're going to look at effective 
witnesses. Verses 3 to 6. And I'll grant authority to my witnesses, and they will prophesy for 1260 days clothed in sackcloth. These are the two olive trees and the two lampstands that stand before the Lord of the earth. And if anyone would harm them, fire pours from their mouth and consumes their foes. If anyone would harm them, this is how he is doomed to be killed. They have the power to shut the sky that no rain may fall during the days of their prophesying. And they have power over the waters to turn them into blood and to strike the earth with every kind of plague as often as they desire. Now, during an intense period of time, those who seek to be faithful to God will experience marginalization, resistance, and aggression. God matches the three and a half years of suffering with an equally present, faithful, and powerful witness of Jesus over the same amount of time, 1260 days. The olive trees and lamps stands are a direct reference to the prophet Zechariah. In chapter 4, these symbols were associated with the ministry of the high priest Joshua and God's appointed ruler Zerubbabel who together combined the ministries of priest and king. These witnesses now represent the churches as lampstands shining through an endless supply of olive oil, which is the power of the Holy Spirit. Because many of the descriptions in apocalyptic literature have a symbolic meaning, it's hard to really define these two witnesses. Because of the references to praying for rain to stop and for water to turn to blood and for plagues, some think Elijah and Moses returned to the earth. It would actually be more accurate to say that these witnesses are like Moses and Elijah in that they speak and minister in the power and authority of God. Whoever speaks with God's power and authority here, who is it? Well, it certainly is God's people, whether it's two individuals or it illustrates more, they are faithful witnesses. Two witnesses here, the term, connect with a number of ideas we read in Scripture. In Deuteronomy 17.6, it's a reference to reliable evidence in court requires two witnesses. We also know that Jesus sent out his disciples in twos. And these two witnesses contrast the two evil challengers that appear later in this book, the the false prophet and the beast. Witness is a shared responsibility. We read that their clothes are sackcloth, which means they, they come in a similar manner as Jonah did to Nineveh. They're calling people, turn from your sin to follow God. In spite of the way the world treats God's people, in spite of their ongoing rejection of the one who created them, God is passionate about letting people know how much he loves them, offering to them forgiveness and life through Jesus, not wanting any of them to perish, but to have eternal life. There have been so many attempts in history to silence the church of Jesus, to eradicate his followers, These witnesses provide a model for us today. We are to be spirit-empowered, ready to pay the cost, and utterly depend on God's power to be his witnesses. We read here in verses 7 to 14 that these witnesses were effective, but now they are exonerated. And when they have finished their testimony, the beast that rises from the bottomless pit will make war on them and conquer them and kill them. And their dead bodies will lie in the street of the great city that symbolically is called Sodom and Egypt, where the Lord was crucified. For three and a half days, some from the peoples and tribes and languages and nations will gaze at their dead bodies and refuse to let them be placed in a tomb. And those who dwell on the earth will rejoice over them and make merry and exchange presents because these two prophets had been a torment to those who dwell on the earth. But after the three and a half days, a breath of life from God entered them, and they stood up on their feet, and great fear fell on those who saw them. Then they heard a loud voice from heaven saying to them, Come up here! 
and they went up to heaven in a cloud, and their enemies watched them. And at that hour there was a great earthquake, and a tenth of the city fell. Seven thousand people were killed in the earthquake, and the rest were terrified and gave glory to the God of heaven. The second woe is past. Behold, the third woe is to come. In verse 7, you see the shift of the, of the tone here. On one hand, we read that nothing can happen to those who are about uh, their father's business in the world without God's permission. Yet time is coming for some when God withdraws his protective hand. In Jewish apocalyptic literature, the beast is a demonic figure, often referring to oppressive rulers or nations that oppose God and harm his people. In one sense, it was Antiochus Epiphanes. In another sense, it was Caesar. But whoever it is, they oppose God and harm his people. For these people, it certainly would have meant the Roman Empire, but it can be whoever Satan appoints to do his work of opposition and destruction. The reference to the bottomless pit takes us back to, to chapter 9, verse 2, and to chapter 20, verse 1 to 3. Satan will be loosed from his restraints and he will unleash destruction against God's witnesses. The great city here, elsewhere in Revelation, refers to Rome. You read about that in chapter 16, 19, 17, 18, chapter 18, verse 10, 16 and 18, and in verses 20 and 21. But because of the reference to the crucifixion of Jesus, it has to be a reference to Jerusalem. And even later in verse 13, the talk is about a city of 70,000. That's too small to be Rome. But in a secondary way, this great city is really every city that embodies self-sufficiency in place of dependence on our Creator. It's also referred to as Sodom in Egypt, which implies that those uh, who live there seek to control the world and oppose God, and they embody evil, rebellion, idolatry, and oppression of God's people. The late Australian New Testament scholar Leon Morris said, the great city is every city and no city. It is civilized man in organized community. Well, the atrocity said to be done against God's people, we know also happened to Jesus. This is the only way Satan knows how to attack. He seeks destruction and death. But the irony is that his victory is so short-lived, just as it was with Jesus on the cross. Compared to a period of three and a half years, this apparent victory will only last three and a half days. It can be a reference to the resurrection of Jesus, but it definitely means Satan's efforts will be overthrown. Those of God's people who have been destroyed, shamed, and exalted over will be exonerated, and the world will see, just like the Roman centurion who said, Jesus surely was the Son of God, they will see that the one they have persecuted is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. If we apply this to the exhortation in the letters to the churches, we know that victory will come to those who overcome. These two images together illustrate that followers of Jesus should live with conviction and confidence that the good news that has come to us is to be shared with others without fear of reprisal or rejection. In the word of the Apostle Paul, we're not to be ashamed of the gospel of Jesus, for it's the power of God for salvation. There's more we could say about this passage, but let's just move on to the final section, which I call a worshipful conclusion, verses 15 to 19. Then the seventh angel blew his trumpet, and there were loud voices in heaven, saying, The kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and has of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. And the twenty-four elders who sit on their thrones before God fell on their faces and worshipped God, saying, We give thanks to you, Lord God Almighty, who is and who was, for you have taken your great power and begun to reign. The nations raged. 
But your wrath came, and the time for the dead to be judged, and for your rewarding your servants, the prophets and saints, and those who fear your name, both small and great, and for destroying the destroyers of the earth. Then God's temple in heaven was opened, and the ark of his covenant was seen within his temple. There were flashes of lightning, rumblings, peals of thunder, an earthquake, and heavy hail. There are two elements in this text that provide a clue into the significant meaning here. First of all, though this is identified as the seventh trumpet, there's no vision of judgment. And number two, the events described in this text are described by verbs in the past tense. To briefly comment on the second point, it means there's absolute certainty about the things that are going to take place. It's not in doubt. God is going to bring an end once for all to sin and death, and we will be with him. With the announcement of the final woe, we, we expect a startling judgment here, though. But instead, we hear a heavenly choir shouting victory. It's actually reminiscent of the angel choir that sang at the first coming of Jesus to the shepherds. Worship's going to rock the heavens, celebrating the reversal of the age of sin, defining the difference between this world and God's kingdom. The oneness of this kingdom between God and Christ, he it will reign. Sin will be no more. Suffering will be no more. There will be vindication and victory. The threefold title of God that we've been used to in Revelation that we've read in chapter 1 verse 4, chapter 1 verse 8, and chapter 4 verse 8 now comes differently to us. Usually it's come to us as the one who was, who is, and is to come. But here we see the final part is removed because God will complete what he has planned. Just like you make plans to attend an event or to travel to a destination, you anticipate it. But once you get there, it's no longer something that you have to look forward to. You're celebrating it. This is a celebration of God's power to complete to destroy sin, to overthrow evil, and set up his final kingdom. The reference here from Psalm 2 that the nations will rage against the king confirm that every knee will bow, every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. The reference here at the end to the ark of God can simply be summarized as a promise that nothing will keep God's people from living in God's presence eternally. Well, I've provided a brief overview of this text, a whirlwind overview, and at the beginning I provided you with two applications. I'd like to just summarize them with you. The first is I hope that you would listen to this and receive a clear conviction and confidence in the purpose and power of sharing and living out your faith. Knowing that our confidence is in a victorious risen Savior who has defeated Satan and the power of sin, we've been given the responsibility to bring this message to the world, not just through world missions, but by sharing it within our homes to our families and in our endeavors to love and care for those around us. Secondly, We've been called to rejoice in the absolute certainty that Jesus is worthy of our faith. The ending of this text provides a model for our worship. We're to give him the thanks due to him, acknowledge what he's done and what he's doing. We're to live in his victory. In chapter 11, 17, he is once again called Lord God Almighty. We've read that in chapter 1, verse 8, chapter 4, verse 8. It's in chapter 15, 3, chapter 16, 7, and verse 14, as well as chapter 19, verse 6, verse 15, and chapter 21, verse 22. Lord God Almighty, don't view the battle between Satan and God as one in which God is struggling to win. He has won. 
And we are also in our worship to celebrate his constancy, the God who was and is. Jesus is not just part of this universe. This is his universe. Well, actually, as we've looked at chapter 11, it appears we've reached the end of history. But strangely, we're only halfway through this book. I hope you look forward, as I do, to reading the rest. Blessed are those who hear these words and keep what is written in them. Amen.